thought, right, maybe this is good news, maybe it isn't, but I did find the time to make up a brand new test for these two classes. And uh, the test will be on the format of the uh, first two tests in the game. Similar, but one thing now I want you to try to remember, folk. When you come to something like NASCAR lines, say South America for an answer. I'll give you at least two points for somebody. I tell the location. I mean, a general location. Um, Arawak, yeah. For, if you see Arawak on a test, I at least want you to put down. They lived in the Caribbean region. Now, you might wonder, why am I going back to American Indians? Because when I got through with the class, I realized there were some things about the American Indians that I simply had not gone over them when I covered before. Go back to Islam. So I'm jumping around just a little bit. Um, all right. Um, a lot of the Inca Indians practiced, they lived on the Andes Mountains and practiced what you call terrace farming. Now by terrace, let's say this is a hillside. What they would do they would cut inside a hill, like so, and your book shows a picture of it. And they would farm on the flat land that they had cut out. These are called terraces. It's somewhat like stair steps. And they would practice terrace farming, farming on the, because it's very difficult to plow under the steep mountain. So they'd cut away on the mountain and uh, make at least part of it flat and farm on the flat land on the side. Uh, the Incas, by the way, lived high in the Andes Mountains, and I'm not going to write that word down. It will not be on the test, but the Andes are a very tall mountain range on the western part of South America. Um, now, last night when I found out I couldn't sleep, I got a YouTube video out, I mean, oh, I mean, turn, I set my computer to a YouTube video and it talked about the American Indians, and it talked about how, the, how advanced the North American Indians were. Um, and some of the Indians say that the, uh, the persons who built the mounds were actually another race. Be that as it may, the mounds were, uh, some of them were more massive than two or three of the Egyptian pyramids combined. But unlike the pyramids, they were made of dirt. But how, I mean, well, the one figure they gave was it would have taken 10,000 people 200 years to build one mound if they had 10,000 workers uh, just simply shoveling the dirt with shovels and putting it on their backpacks. They would keep in mind, as far as we know, the American Indians did not have the wheels, so they had no wheelbarrows, no carts. Um, so they probably had to carry their, uh, and they had no pack animals that we know of even that far back. Again, how did they move the dirt? I personally think they had techniques that we are not aware of. The big serpent mound in Ohio that talked about, not only is it 10 miles long, but actually it has various places. It has, it's an, it was an astronomical observatory. And it told them when to plant their crops, when to harvest. It was basically like a computer told them uh, when the eclipses of the moon would occur and when the eclipses of the sun would, would occur. In other words, these people were very, very highly advanced. And uh, there are all kinds of tunnels and all kinds of underground passages that we're finding that was built by somebody way, way back yonder that the Indians didn't even claim were one of those, or that were one of them. Who built them? We don't know. Now, the uh, Arawak. The Arawak Indians were the first were the Indians that Christopher Columbus encountered. Today, they're considered extinct. I mean, they were declared extinct in the mid 1700s, but we have um, done some DNA studies and we've dug up some old Arawak, we might say Arawak bones, and we found out that some 60% of the Indian people living in the Caribbean today are carrying Arawak DNA. So they may be extinct as a tribe or extinct as a nation, but their descendants are still living on. 
Um, the Arawak were slaughtered by the Europeans, and yesterday was Columbus Day, and I was reminded after I got home about that some people want to abolish Columbus Day, saying that Columbus was a mass murderer, one of the greatest mass murderers in history, and all he did was spread disease. And uh, by the way, it wasn't just the diseases, by the way, did not just go one way. The Indians had diseases, they spread to the Europeans also. It's believed, or has been believed for many years, that one of the diseases the Indians gave Europeans was syphilis. Now, again, some people dispute that. But syphilis found its way into Spain thanks to one of Columbus's crewmen. And European doctors recognized quickly how it spread, but it was to be many generations before they found a cure. Now, I want to say this about today's syphilis. They tell me, folks, that there is no cure today. And once you have it, you'll always have it. But the old syphilis of 50 and 75 and 80 years ago, they can cure it then. Today, I've heard it can't be cured. Now, if any of you know any different or have heard any different, your input is welcome. But uh, that it's resistant to all the drugs that we have and resistant to all the uh, treatments that we have. And once you have it, you're going to have to live with it the rest of your life. It used to cause blindness, dementia, sterility, and premature death. Today it causes the same thing, blindness, sterility, dementia, and premature death. By dementia, that means you lose your mind. So it's still as deadly, if not more so, than it ever was. But it's believed by some that it was an American Indian disease that spread to Columbus's, by one of Columbus's crewmen into Europe. But again, others say that no, Europe had these diseases before. Now, among the a lot of the Indian tribes, now this was not true, folk, of the more advanced tribes, of the, uh, of the Aztec and Incas, but among a lot of American Indian tribes, including the Arawak, women were treated equal to the men. Now, Every time I start to say this, folk, I hesitate. I mean, I'm, 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 I am hesitant. And if you think I'm terrified of saying it, well, you're right, I am. But your authors devote a section on women on every chapter, after, particularly after chapter one, they'll talk about the women, where the women stood. Now, folk, I don't think your authors even are aware that what they are saying is that the more equal the women were, the more primitive the society was. Now that's maybe a shocking loaded statement, and if it offends anybody, maybe it's my job as a professor to offend you. If you want to disprove me, you can try to. I mean, all right, let's look for a minute. The Chinese, they would sometimes kill their female babies they didn't want. That's in the records. But they were the next most highly advanced people except for Europeans. The people of India, they would sometimes require their wives to, when their husbands died, to burn themselves in a fire. They were an advanced people. The Muslims, they got highly advanced. They did not in any way treat women as equals. Who got it right? Western Europeans, to me, did the best job of treating the women. Western European Christianity said that, yes, women should be under subjection. And that's one reason why American Indian women did not want to embrace Christianity. But it also said that women should be treated with honor and respect. Knights in Europe were expected to buy by the code of chivalry where they treated women with courtesy and kindness and respect. And also there was the European Christians tended to love the Virgin Mary and this elevated women somewhat and uh, tended to give women more respect. But nevertheless, all right, having said that, if any of you want to make a comment, I'll close my mouth and let you know who wants to say something. Say what you want to say. Again, your authors don't say this in any one place. I, they say it in various places throughout the book. Without, and again, I don't even know if they really want to say yes. How are they equal? How are they equal? Um, okay. Basically, um, they were allowed to. But of course, a lot of these tribal peoples did not hold office. I mean, they did not have a public office as such. They had a chief of the tribe. The chief of the tribe was most of the time a man, but there was no inequality between social classes or inequality between anything. And uh, so uh, they were simply uh, looked on as being uh, 
the same as the men when it came to uh, well, there, there, again, it's hard to explain. There were no, there was no private ownership of property, but they were allowed to divorce their husbands. They were allowed to initiate divorce proceedings when they wanted to. Uh, they were allowed to leave a marriage when they wanted to. They were equal in those ways. I'd like to say equal in holding property, but again, the, a lot of the American Indians did not have any private ownership of property. Um, now the Aztecs. They did not regard the women as equal, nor as the women were slaves, and it, uh, Montezuma's tax collectors was known to go around and take any woman they wanted to use as a sex slave. Um, again, I, folk, I disagree with a lot of the ways that women have been treated down through. I mean, I'm, I, I'm married to a woman. I have two daughters. Nevertheless, what I've noticed is when you start making women equal, they can't be equal. Charge in front of the show. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, I, that subject I hate talking about. I'm going to uh, tell you on a personal note, I dated two. One of them was a woman's liver, and then later when a woman's liver died, another one was a, from the, what they call the woman's movement. And in both cases, the relationship was a disaster. Yes, they tried to control me. And for a while, did. Oh, yes. Hey, I'm the oldest of seven children, and an oldest son does not, does not be, allow himself to be controlled for long. Simply won't. Especially when you have three brothers and three sisters who are going sooner or later. I mean, I was. Uh, I hear what I did. Uh. <coughs> All right, folks. All right, that's, uh, maybe I should leave that stuff out, but again, I mean, uh, again, your authors say this without, I don't even know if they know this, realize they're saying it. Check in this chapter, that chapter, another chapter, another chapter, and this is what they wind up saying. Leaving that, um, the Arawak had equality between the men and women. Today, the Arawak are extinct. Now, some of the, the Indians living in South America were advanced. I'm not going to name the tribes, especially since folk, I wasn't even aware these tribes existed until about five or six years ago. And so I'm not going to name them, except for the Incans. They practiced terrace farming. Um, now, but one thing I do want to mention. Now, folk, in a history book that's used in a lot of colleges, this is highly unusual. Your authors talk about the Nazca lines. Simply stated, the Nazca lines are miles and miles of sometimes straight lines, or sometimes are the shape of a bird or some animal. Your book has a picture of them. From the ground, I mean, if you're walking along and you go from the edge of an Nazca line, you can barely tell that there's any difference. I mean, you might not even notice that the coloration of the ground changes. You have to get in an airplane to see that, hey, this is a long straight line. And you get higher up in a really high airplane, like a 45,000 foot jet airliner, you say hey, these lines extend for miles, so this line is in the shape of some kind of a bird. And now, folk, your authors, and if any of you read a book, you know what I'm talking about, suggest that some people believe that aliens constructed the Nazca lines. And it's hard to believe you'd see that in history, but it's in your, it's in your book. I can show you the exact page if you wanted me to. Um, I have read a lot of books who say that the Nazca lines have to have been directed by somebody from a space vantage point radioing down to people on Earth. I don't know what I believe, but it's difficult to imagine how that primitive people construct something. Now, folk, I'm not going to apologize for stating the people who lived way back then were advanced. I don't believe it was aliens. I believe the persons who constructed them we're using techniques that even today we don't have. And maybe we couldn't construct them without, I mean, of course we have a space station. Maybe we'd have to have a vantage point of our astronauts in space directing the show to workers down on Earth, or people in a high up, very high airplane directing the show to workers on the ground. Maybe we would, but maybe they had techniques of getting straight lines and we don't know. I mean, hey, what did my mother, they taught us in the army, what my dad always said, Human beings cannot walk in a straight line. If you get lost in a wide open desert and you start walking, 
you're going to wind up back where you started from. Because you wind up, what you're doing is your one foot takes a bigger step than the other. Now, you won't know that if you have seen the army, they taught us, pick out an object and head for that object, and you'll be walking straight. But if you just walk, you're going to walk in a circle. Um, so again, it's impossible to make a really straight line over the horizon without some kind of a geometric tool, a laser beam or a compass or some kind of a tool or else being directed by people from an airplane. Um, all right. Um, now, okay, now I'll move on from this to Islam. On the test, I'll tell you, I'm going to tell the next class. This is one question I have is I'm going to ask a like. It's a bonus question. The question is, name five points at least where the Islam comes into conflict with the United States Constitution. You can be thinking about that. I'll be answering them as I go along. I'm not going to stand here and name them now. I want you to do the research. Understood? You do the research yourself. But there are several areas where the United States Constitution and Islamic law set forth by Mohammed and the people who came after come into conflict. Alright, by way of overview, Islam in the last thousand years has not invented anything significant. Now I had an Islamic boy argue, a young man argued with me about that. He showed me an article that some Islamic person had been in an airplane and a radio. If they did, they never gave these gifts to the world. But there were two inventions that an Islamic persons, the Islamic persons made. An Iranian mathematician, your book doesn't give his name at all, created algebra. In other words, using letters instead of numbers. Very important. Algebra is the lowest of the uh, advanced maths. I mean, when you study mathematics, you start off with arithmetic. Basic, you know, 3 plus 2 equals 5. Uh, 3 times 2 equals 6. That's basic arithmetic. Then you go from arithmetic to algebra, where you do the same thing except you use letters. I mean, some of you might know what I'm talking about. And you, but you have to know algebra before you can go into geometry, trigonometry, and calculus. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Maybe you don't. Okay, nobody's saying this morning. But you have to know algebra before you can go to advanced mathematics. The other thing they gave, and folks, this is, might sound like it's trivial, but it's extremely important. They gave us the Arabic numerals with, and this is important, the number zero. Now, to give you some idea about the Arabic numerals, I'm going to do a math problem here. Ten divided by thirty equals. Anybody know how I did that? I faked it. You cannot do long division. You can't do division with Roman numerals. I, I, I didn't I don't use the Roman numerals. Like, for instance, I have V4 divided into 8 equals. I'm faking that. I know it in my head. Actually, you cannot divide using Roman numerals. You cannot do multiplications using Roman numerals. X, X times. Uh, let's see, 3 equals 60. That is, whoops, I've got myself lost. Let me think, change it. Uh, VI 6 times 6 equals XVI, yeah, 36. Again, I'm faking it because I know these things in my head. You can't do multiplication using Roman numerals. Subtraction or addition or anything using Roman numerals. You can just simply record the number. That's all you can do. Without Arabic numerals and without the number zero, we could not have arithmetic. Very important. These were the big uh, contributions that they made to our society uh, that uh, they gave. And I, the point I'm making here. 
before we get into the lesson further, the Arabs went so far ahead of the Europeans in astronomy, in medicine, in mathematics. They once were ahead, folk, far ahead. But you ever hear the story of the proverbial rabbit racing the turtle? How many of you know what happened when a rabbit raced a turtle one day? The rabbit decided he was far enough ahead, he went to the stop by the trail side and slept. And a turtle went to the finish line. Basically, my own European ancestors were the turtle. The Arabs were the rabbit. They went to sleep. And the Europeans passed them up. And it really bothers them that they have the technology and science left them behind because Mohammed encouraged. Here's why, folk, in one sentence. And they reached a point in our study of science, and everybody does this at one point, including the Europeans. They reached a point where that their science came into conflict with their theology. And they abandoned science and embraced their theology. Now, Europeans did the same thing. Sometimes science comes into conflict with the Bible. I think science is wrong, but it does. But the difference was with the Europeans, the Europeans kept on advancing their science anyway. The Muslim world did not. The Chinese, by the way, did the same thing. The Chinese were far ahead of both Islam and Europe. But Chinese philosophers convinced their emperors to stop their advancement on philosophical grounds, not religious. And the result was China stagnated. All right, having said that, we'll go back to the history of the Arabs now. In ancient times, great conquerors like Sargon and Hammurabi and Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus had united the Middle East. Alexander the Great had. Then for centuries, the Middle East was divided. Then Islam burst out of Arabia and it united the Middle Eastern world once again. Then within a few generations, the Middle Eastern world fragmented and has remained so to this day. Arabia. Arabia is the land where Islam began. They did not have written records. If they did, their written records have not come down to us. So most of what we know about them comes from outsiders. They, uh, they had a lot of trade and their caravans traveled a lot and that, that brought them into contact with the outside world. In addition, there were times when the Silk Road that joined China to the Mediterranean went through Arabia. Now the route of the Silk Road would change depending on the political winds. But they would take the route where they would be least likely to find thieves, robbers. So there were times when the Silk Road went through Arabia. Now most of the people in Arabia were poor Bedouins, and this word Bedouin describes Basically, it's a, word, it's a word that describes desert people who live in North Africa and Arabia. They're desert people who live near an oasis or who travel from one oasis to another. Right, the word oasis means a water place in the desert, a place in the desert where you can find water. And uh, the people would build towns around these oases and do a little bit of farming and grow a, few, a little bit of farming and keep a little bit of livestock alive. But they turn, yes. Um, I don't think so because the region of the Kurds is not quite as sandy and desert like the Sahara or like the Arabian desert. So I, I don't believe the Kurds are what you call Bedouins. The Be Bedouins were still around. In the Bible, Abraham was a Bedouin. So was his son and grandson Isaac and Jacob. They started off some as Bedouins. Basically, it's, a, it's a, related to the word nomad. Except Bedouins are describing only mostly desert people. Nomads is anyone who roams around. So, uh, but basically a lot alike. Anyway, uh, a lot of the people in Arabia were poor Bedouins who tended to be uh, nomadic people living in small cities around an oasis. Their religion at first was polytheistic. Now, folk, 
what your book says is that Allah was the chief spirit who is ruling over other spirits. I have heard it said, now again, I'm not going to argue the point that Allah at first, Allah, was at first just in one of many gods that they worshipped. That actually in some ways he might have been a lesser god. But if you talk to any Arab today, he would, they'll tell you, oh, Allah was always the chief god. Again, I'm not going to argue. Um, but uh, Now, in the city of Mecca, where did it start? There was a black stone that was said to have fallen down from heaven. This stone probably was a meteorite, and yes, it is known as, I mean, most meteorites burn up in the atmosphere. And even the ones that don't get quite hot, but some of the larger ones will stay intact as they fall, and they'll fall to the ground. And supposedly a big black stone fell from heaven. And uh, this stone is called the Kaaba. Uh, I mean, again, that's a foreign word, so I wrote it in, oops, I should have written it in cursive. The Kaaba. Um, and around this stone were 360 idols, one for every day of the year. Now, I know you're going to say there are 365 days of the year, but some of the old calendars only had 360 days of the year. That's where we get the 360 degree, degree circumference, 360 days. And folks, some people believe that at one time the earth had 360 days of the year due to the flood and a few other catastrophes. This changed to 365 and the calendar had to change. But believe, be that as it may, Around the Kaaba were 360 idols, one idol for every day of the year. Now, the Kaaba is still there. The idols have been destroyed. Mohammed himself destroyed them. The Kaaba made news recently. Some 1,400 people were trampled nearby it, uh, trampled to death in a big mass of stampede. This has happened several times in recent memory, and the Arabs have been blamed for, hey, you people could control your crowds a little bit better. Uh, but anyway, be that as it may. Now, they had no priesthood. Now, folk, this is very important. Islam has no priest. The word priest means a mediator between God and man. A person or the, the idea that an ordinary person is just not capable of going in front of a holy God, so he needs to go through a mediator. That's the need for a priest. But well, in Islam, they believe that everybody has direct access to God with no need for a priest to be here. Now, they do have church officials called ayatollahs or clerics. Yeah, the ayatollah is like the word reverend in our vocabulary. But they don't have priests. And um, this has brought them into conflict with African religion because the Africans do have priests. But the, the Arabic people had none because everybody took equal part. Um, when the Byzantine Empire, let's see what was left of the Roman Empire, is called the Byzantine, and Persian Empire were fighting each other. Traders, to get around the fighting, went through Arabia, where the fighting was not going on, and this led to some people becoming rich. And this is where our story of Mohammed begins. As I mentioned last class, Mohammed was orphaned at the age of six. He grew up in very deep poverty, with his father and mother both gone. When he grew up, he married his boss, you might say. He married a wealthy woman who herself was to come the money from her former husband who was a merchant. So she had inherited the, her husband's property and her husband's wealth. So he became wealthy himself. And he got even wealthier through the trade but that went on between, but because the Silk Road was now going through the northern part of Arabia. And he began to have conflicts with his, over his newfound wealth. So he um, went off into the hills nearby. I want to say in the woods, but keep in mind Arabia has no woods as such. So he'd go off to meditate. And while meditating, the angel Gabriel appeared to him according to his own account. And uh, from there he started a new religion called Islam. 
Mohammed believed that Moses and Jesus had only received part of the truth, but he was given the rest of the truth. And this is what Islam uses to say, well, Mohammed came later and he received it as a revelation, but revelation the others had not received. Therefore, his is the best. Now, in Islam, there have been groups that have broken off from Islam who have said that no, another prophet came along later and received a later revelation. But, but mainstream Islam teaches that Mohammed was the real prophet who received the final, last revelation from God. Um, his mess, out of his messages came a certain book called the Quran. Now, about the Quran, there's some controversy. Every Islamic person will say the Quran was written by Muhammad while Muhammad was alive. And it was written only one time, and they got it right the first time, and it's not been changed from that day to this. But some scholars who have studied have found evidence that actually a lot of it was written after Mohammed died and was written from a compilation of writings, some of which were not Mohammed's. Again, I'm not going to argue the point. I mean, but I'm just want you to know that uh, some scholars do not believe it was all written by Mohammed and written one time. And uh, what we have is the, the original and the final. Uh, but some say it was actually revised a few times. Anyway, the Quran is still with us, and it's written in Arabic. And according to their own traditions, it cannot be translated in any other language. Now, granted, it has been translated in other languages, but it's, it is not supposed to be. Um, now, Mohammed began to teach his message to his fellow Meccans. I mean, he lived in the city of Mecca. The Meccans rejected it. So he fled from Mecca to Medina, city nearby and if you look on a map the old maps of Arabia they'd have two capitals one capital of Mecca and one capital of Medina but the people of Medina accepted his message well once he became powerful enough and strong enough in Medina he went back to Mecca and he conquered Mecca by force and converted the inhabitants of Mecca by force and this was the beginning of Islamic forceful conversions. Once in Mecca, he destroyed the 360 idols around the Kaaba. But he left the Kaaba alone, and the Kaaba is still sacred. And one of the commandments that Islamic people have to follow is if, if at all possible, they're expected to visit the Kaaba in Mecca at least once in their lifetime. And this is a reasonable stampede. They get a big, big crowd of thousands of people together at once, and sometimes the crowd gets out of hand. They have had people down through the years get trampled to death by the hundreds. And this last trampling, the last time I heard, occurred last month, killed some 1,400 people. <coughs> a pilgrimage occurs, by the way, during the Ramadan or during their holy month, which is roughly corresponds with our month of September. <coughs> <coughs> I'm almost over my cold. The flight from Mecca to Medina is called the Hijra. That word might be pronounced Hijra. And Muslims keep time from this point. It's at 622 CE, I believe, somewhere in there. But Muslims count time from this flight from Mecca to Medina as being the beginning of their calendar. And uh, anyway, once. He had taken control of the city of Mecca and firmly established himself in Mecca. Um, he then conquered the rest of Arabia. Well, I, he, he, he proceeded to conquer the rest of Arabia. I put it that way, he proceeded. But he did not live to see all of Arabia conquered to Islam. Two years after he had taken over Mecca, he himself died. When he died, Abu Baker took over. I'm not going to put that name down. It's not that. But basically, his father-in-law, his wife's father, took charge. And she, um, I mean, he, his, you know, his wife's father, was to lead Islam to victory over all the rest of Arabia. And then when he died, there occurred a big split. 
that is still splitting the Arabs to this day, or the Muslims, between Shiite and Sunni. Now the big split has to do with who's to lead. Now folk, I can't tell you which one of these groups is which. I've tried to learn it, but I always get it mixed up. But one of them believes that only Mohammed's family should lead. The other believes that no, the person who has the most ability should lead. Whoever is the greatest and uh, can basically. All right, now because Mohammed never picked a succession, a big problem the Muslim world has had all the way down through the last 1400 years is when the leader dies, oftentimes there's a big power struggle, and the one who is still alive when it's over, he becomes a leader. They wind up killing each other until one of them becomes the leader. But basically, the, the big conflict. Now, granted, there's other things about it. The um, Sunni is generally more tolerant of the Western ideas and Western ways, and the Shiite are more radical. And uh, we have generally sided with the Sunnis against the Shiites. Uh, so there are some other differences, but the original difference was over who was to lead. Originally, Mohammed's family led. Now, something else about the leadership. You will hear from time to time, and folks, this is not in the book. It will not be on a test, but I won't write it down. About 12 imams. If you look at the history of the imams, the first 11 of them, every one of them met their death violently. Either they were poisoned by their wives, or one of their wives, or they were murdered by the local caliph, who is caliph at that time. But then comes Imam number 12. There's even, some people wonder, did Imam number 12 even exist? Imam number 12 supposedly just disappeared one day. He's the one who they believe is going to come back. When he comes back, he's going to be like the Messiah, the Shahab, the Messiah, the Shia. And he's going to conquer the world. And it's up to each Islamic person then to make way for the 12th Imam, to prepare the way for the 12th Imam, so that when he comes, they will uh, be ready, they'll be ready to conquer the world under his leadership. Yes? <clears throat> um, to clarify what you were saying earlier, so I think you said you were more sure. Maybe it was the Sunnis who um, thought that Mohammed was going to The Sunnis thought Mohammed's heir should be rel his relatives? No, the Sunnis didn't. Oh, that's okay. Then I'll send, I get them mixed up. So you're saying the Sunnis are the ones who did not believe it, and the Shiite were the ones who believed it should be Mohammed's relatives. Okay, uh, if any of you know any more about it, you can put it as welcome. I get them mixed up. But I do want you to know that these two words, uh, regrettably, I want to tell you some folks, Islam was not considered very important when I was growing up. And we just simply forgot about them and ignored them. And now all of a sudden it's become the most important part of world history. It's, uh, and this conflict between Shiite and Sunni hate, does it affect us? Does it, I mean, those of us who are Americans, I believe strongly it does. Um, now, um, anyway, Mohammed himself passed on. Now, um, there are a few things I want to say about Mohammed's personal life. He was faithful to his wife as long as she lived. Then when his wife died, his wife was much older than he. He had several wives. And one of them was a nine-year-old girl. Now before you start thinking he was a pedophile, you have to understand in the time period he lived, a lot of men would marry what women, we, young girls we consider children today. This practice was widespread in, in India, for instance. So, And even Europeans sometimes European nobles would get married as young as seven, six and seven because a certain person wanted to grab up their neighbor's estate and when the father died and left an orphan who was six years old of the opposite sex, they would, I mean, sometimes grown women would marry a seven-year-old boy just to get some hold of that, that estate. So it, this was not unknown um, in, the, in the world we're talking about. But, uh, Again, I've heard some people criticizing and them severely for it, but uh, can you have to understand the time period they lived in, where a lot of young girls married quite young, owing to the fact that life was generally short. That still happens uh, a lot. That's that? That still happens a lot. Today. In the in the modern world, yes. In that area of the world. In that area of the world, yeah. Okay, yes, I've heard that too. I didn't, I did not mention it. But, uh, it still, it still goes on. Uh, so. Uh, 
Mohammed also allowed a man to have up to four wives, if he could afford them. Women were only allowed to have one husband. This law, by the way, is still in the books in Muslim countries. Um, with all respect, I mean, if you read the Old Testament, a lot of those men had more than one wife, and folk here's why it was necessary. Because of wars, wars would carry away so many men, and also the perils of hunting and, uh, and uh, other perils that men faced that women didn't. Women greatly outnumbered men. So uh, if, uh, if, the, if some of the men had not doubled up with more than one wife, the human population might have become extinct. So because the women would outnumber the men two and three to one, a lot of men who survived the wars or who survived the hunting trips would take on two or three, sometimes multiple wives. And your kings would have a whole harem full of wives, up to you know 50 or 100. In Solomon's case, 2,000 wives and concubines. All right. Now, after, uh, oh yeah, after uh, uh, Mohammed died and his father-in-law took over, Mohammed's father-in-law instituted the old Arab tribal practice of conducting raids, which was called jihad. And again, that's a foreign word, and I've written it in the cursive. If you use it, folks, write it in italics. And then, then uh, if you write it on a test, I don't care how you write it, but if you use it in a formal paper, these words must be written in italics, you understand, because they're foreign words. Anyway, a jihad has come to mean, I mean, originally it meant strive in the way of the Lord. I'll back, backing up. Originally, it was simply where that one tribe would conduct a raid to steal another tribe's, as much of the other tribe's goods as they could steal, and then run off. They would sneak up on a neighboring tribe, and again, that's difficult to do in a desert, folks, because the desert's wide open, no place to hide. They would sneak up somehow at night, or as best they could sneak up, raid the neighbors and run. This was a original jihad. Then it became under uh, Abu Baker, Mohammed's successor, a way of what's called strive in the way of the Lord. Today it's called a holy war. Now Islam teaches that persons who die in a jihad are guaranteed paradise. And they have, and I've heard 70 or I've heard 72 virgins waiting for them in paradise. Uh, now, this folk explains why that Arabs, more so than communists, like in my day, the young, when I was young, the big issue was communism. Communists were not likely to strap weapons themselves, blow themselves to bits, because the communists believed that this life was the only one it was, and when this life was over, you went into oblivion. You had no soul, and that was it. But the Arabs believe that they have guaranteed a life into paradise if they kill themselves for the cause. So they were more willing to blow themselves up, and they'll go to a marketplace for booby traps, and this happens pretty regularly. In fact, just recently, like last week, some Arab booby trapped himself and went into the, the Turkey's capital, Ankara, blew himself up and killed, I don't know how many people, somebody might know how many people was killed, but it was dozens of persons that they killed. And they, of course, they apparently were killed when they, uh, when they blew themselves up. Again, they believe, now, you have to understand, in Islam, Islamic people have no assurance of a happy afterlife. They can try to keep all the rules. They can, um, they can visit Mecca. They can abstain from all alcohol. They can abstain from all tobacco. They can abstain from all gambling. But when it, it comes time to die, all of himself decides whether he'll take them in or not, and none of them know whether they're going to have a happy afterlife. The only assurance they have of a happy afterlife is to die in a holy war, and then they're guaranteed that Allah will take them in. This explains why that they are willing to sacrifice themselves in a jihad. Um, now, again, if any of you want to dispute what I've said, you're welcome to help argue how this. Okay. 
what I'm talking about, you've, most of you have probably heard some of this before, especially. Have you not? Nobody? If you, okay, a few heads are nodding. I mean, 40 and 50 years ago, folks, you would not have heard this. Because we did not discuss this in much depth. Today, I mean, this is making news right and left. Anyway, another thing about Islam, it has no real provision for forgiveness. Um, now, I had an Islamic young man dispute that and say, well, you can be forgiven if you stop your sinning and lead a holy life from here on out. But even then, you're not certain sure you're forgiven. Unlike Christianity, where there is a provision made for forgiveness for sins, Islam has none. Now, there is a story about a an American who visited an Arab country and made friends with an Arab. And this Arab said, now, see that man over there? You want to stay away from him? He's a camel thief. Yeah, but really, what makes him a camel thief? Well, he comes from a long line of camel thieves. When the American inquired further, he found out that this man, one of his ancestors, had stolen a camel 800 years ago. And his descendants have had that stigma attached to him of being a camel thief for the last 800 years. No forgiveness. No... Uh, now, this may be extreme, but nevertheless, they, they have no provision for forgiveness, and they have no assurance of a happy afterlife. Anyway, after um, they had conquered all of Arabia, fortunately for them, the Byzantine Empire had just finished off the Persian Empire after hundreds of years of fighting between the two, but both empires were weak. Well. They quickly defeated the Persian Empire and annexed Persia. And Persia is today called Iran, and Persia is under Islam to this day. Then they defeated the Byzant a Byzantine army that outnumbered the Byzantine army, outnumbered four to one. But nevertheless, they defeated the Byzantine army. But they were not able to conquer the Byzantines yet. Now, they finally did in 1453, but they backed away at the Byzantine Empire. But the Byzantine Empire was to last for a while. Um, having not been able to completely wipe out the Byzantine Empire, they next went into North Africa, and they conquered all of North Africa, beginning with Egypt. They conquered Egypt, and they conquered what is today Libya, and then uh, Algeria until they had this vast area of the desert. Now, again, if you know anything about the map of these places, all these places they conquered tend to be desert. And here's a point I want to make. These people were excellent fighters in the desert. Get them in an area where there's a lot of vegetation, a lot of woodland, a lot of trees. They couldn't handle it. Their way of fighting was to mount on horses or on, even on camels and just swoop down, mostly on horses, swoop down on an unsuspecting enemy and overpower the enemy by sheer stampede or sheer force of uh, their speed. But now, uh, you may, uh, I'm going to an extreme. Islam never made any headway in Vietnam. Why? Vietnam's a jungle. Their way of fighting simply could not, and of course I have to say too, the United States did not make much headway in Vietnam either. Uh, again, the Vietnamese know how to handle their jungle fighting. Now granted, if the Vietnamese had tried to come out of the jungle, they could never have defeated an Islamic army in the open desert. But then the, the, the uh, Islamic armies that came out of the desert could not fight the Rala Desert. And this is important because after they had conquered North Africa, the Islamic people then went into Spain. They were never able to conquer all of Spain, but they conquered part of Spain. And they were to hold on to this part of Spain for some 700 years. Eventually, they were driven out. They drove them out, Ferdinand and Isabella, two kings, the king and queen who got together and drove them out, and the year was 1492. And then after they'd driven them out, this queen Isabella felt like she was secure enough financially to finance Columbus's trip. So uh, but they did not, would not make a move until the last of the war, they called them Moors, so until the last of the Moors driven out of Spain. But anyway, they got part of Spain, and then they tried going into France. But keep in mind, Spain and France have a lot of vegetation, a lot of trees. They were stopped and at the border of, between Spain and France. They were stopped at the Battle of Tours. Now, I keep referring to a book about the 10 most decisive battles of the world. 
The Battle of Tours is one of the most decisive battles in world history. I mean, it was looked on it because in that battle, the French met the Moors and defeated them, stopped them. All right, when I was a kid, I read a book that was half fiction. The, the leader of the Franks was Charles Martel, who was not really the king, but he was mayor of the palace. We'll talk more about him later. But Charles Martel was bigger than the other Franks. And uh, the people were spreading a rumor that all these Moors, every one of them are as big and big, bigger than Charles Martel. They can't be defeated, can't work. But then finally someone goes, hey, I've been among the Moors. I've traded among them. And they're not as big as Charles. In fact, none of them are as big as Charles. They're as small as And furthermore, if you hit them hard enough with a sword, they will fall down. We can whip them. Anyway, they got together in a fight. And during the fight, by the end of the day, when the sun went down, both sides stopped fighting. Nobody knew who had won. When the French woke up the next morning, prepared to fight, they looked toward the enemy, where the enemy had been. And the enemy was gone. They sent out scouts and found the enemy had spent all night fleeing the battlefield. Essentially, they were a cowardly type of people who, when somebody stood up to them who was a people, they wouldn't stay around and fight. They run. But anyway, they were stopped at the Battle of Tours under the leadership of, yes, Charles Martel. Uh, this was in the uh, late 700s. So they never made much headway into Europe. Now, on the east side of them, but they did try to pinch in Europe from both sides. They, they went to Spain and got part of Spain, and they slowly hacked away at the Byzantine Empire, which is on the east, and eventually they conquered the Byzantine Empire. All told, folk, they would possibly have conquered the world. Their dream. Like the communists, and I asked this on the last pass, like the communists, their dream was to conquer the world. Now, here's the main reason, I mean, part of the reason was they only knew how to fight in a desert type of environment. That's true. They couldn't fight where the vegetation was thick. They didn't fight very well in the mountainous regions. All that is true, but there's another reason why they didn't conquer the world. They started fighting among themselves. And folks, this explains how Israel exists to this day. Israel has about two and a half million people. The Arabs once, the last time I heard, had 40 million people. So why does Israel still exist? Well, two reasons. Reason number one is the Arabs are fighting among themselves a lot. But there's another reason. Israel got its weapons from the United States and the Arabs got the weapons from Russia. And when American-made weapons got to fighting against Russian-made weapons, the American-made weapons proved to be far, far better. Now that may not be as true now as it once was. I think the Russians have improved. Yes? Didn't, um, when America helped out Israel, did they install like missile disarmament or something like that? Because I know that we've got them. Like, we gave the Israelis a whole lot of weaponry. Yeah. Uh, rifles, tanks, airplanes, and missiles which uh, the Israelis used to just clobber the Arabs. Because they've got, I, know, I think, uh, they've got um, technology that detects them, and they've The Israelis, them. yeah, they've, uh, in recent times, the Israelis have detected, have gotten weapons that they can, they can tell where every Arab tank is yeah. located, where every Arab plane is located. I mean, back when the last war occurred in 1973, the report said Israel must make peace with the Arabs because time is on the Arab side. Fast forward to 2015 and time has not been on the Arab side. Technology has taken over to the point where the technology has all favored the Israelis. And again, the Arabs are like divine. If, uh, anyway, um, if the United States had not supplied the Arabs with some weapons, the Arabs would still be shooting pop guns, you might say, old, old timey rifles. But, um, but again, a main reason, though, back to the time period we were talking about, the Arabs started fighting among themselves. They became disunited, and they remain disunited to this day. Um, if they had managed to hold together, who knows what they might could have done. But they didn't. 
and uh, they're in fighting among themselves. Another thing, though, that they, that they lacked oh, is, I'm jumping around in the story a little bit, jumping ahead, but here's where the uh, system broke down. For a long time, their science was ahead of Europeans, but then their scientific advances stopped, and Europeans surpassed them in technology. By the 1700s, European weapons were so much better than Arab weapons. European rifles were better. European artillery was better. And European shipping building techniques were better. And uh, European technology became so. Then, of course, eventually the Europeans invented the automobile, the airplane, the tank, and the machine gun, the repeating rifle, all of which the Arabs did not invent any of. And every Arab nation, practically, with the impossible exception of Morocco, Every Arab nation was conquered by some European country at one time. Egypt was conquered by Britain, and uh, France was conquered. I mean, France conquered Iraq. Italy conquered Libya. France conquered Algeria. Um, Britain conquered Palestine. What is today Israel? So every, the Arabs simply fell behind technologically. Now, folk, you might ask the question: Why did they fall behind? Here, I think is the reason. They had a system designed to guarantee that nobody could invent. If the Wright brothers had been born in an Arabic country, they would never have invented the airplane. If Thomas Edison, I mean, he was the greatest Western, Western inventor of all time. If Thomas Edison had been born in an Arabic country, he would never have invented anything. If you want to dispute that, go ahead. Why? What was wrong with them? They lacked the freedom to innovate. Inventions are made by people who have the freedom to dissent. In other words, Robert Fulton, when he invented the steamship, they called it Fulton's Folly. They laughed at it until the thing started to work. Then they stopped laughing. There was a professor in 1903 published an article saying that mankind will never fly a heavier than air machine. Now, granted, we were flying balloons that a heavier than air machine will never fly. He proved it with mathematics. The problem with his math was he left some figures out that he should have left in. We know that now. But he said once this, once an airplane pilot slows down, he starts to fall. Well, that's probably, he can drop it down. So he said, how shall a man land without destroying his delicate machinery? He published an article, and within weeks, the Wright brothers flew a heavier than air machine after being told by this professor, the freedom to dissent. Now, if you read that sample paper I had you that I put in my web page, it was written by an Arab, I mean, a, by a Muslim young man. He taught it was terrible. In this country, we allow our senators to disagree with our president. Now, folk, isn't that awful? When a senator would disagree with the president, no, no, it's not awful. It's called freedom. It also, freedom is what makes for the ability to innovate, to change, to do better. The Arabs are so hard against change that their language, it's believed that if they could talk to Mohammed, they could understand it. They have not changed their language a bit since the days Mohammed did. In the meantime, our English language is known to have changed so much that if you met a man from the year 1200, Without proper special training, you'd never understand him, and he couldn't understand you. It's known in our language. The English language has changed that much in the last 800 years. We change. We innovate. We invent new words. And the Arabs, they, even when they invent something new or get some new device, they simply will not use a different word to describe that device. They incorporate one of their old words they've already had to that device. No innovation. No change. Now. Something else that's held them back. Let's say the issue is drinking. Now, I had a person in my class say, I don't see the connection between allowing to drink and technological advancement. There is one, folk, and here's what it is. No area is harder against drinking alcohol than I am. And no Muslim is any harder against adultery than I am. 
No Muslim is any harder against smoking tobacco than I am, but there's a difference between me and Ann. The difference is I believe that these decisions should be made by each individual himself without being made by the government. Do you know what I understand what I'm saying? Words, you should be allowed to decide, and I should be allowed whether I drink or not. You should be allowed to decide, and I should put whether I smoke or not. You shouldn't have the government telling you you can't drink, you can't smoke. These things, these decisions, these issues are better off if left up to each individual to decide for himself or herself. In the Islamic world, the government decides these issues for you. So what's the result? They have a stagnant society that doesn't innovate, doesn't change, doesn't invent, hasn't been anything in more than a thousand years. Is there a connection between the government imposing restrictions on you and technological progress? Folk, I think so. Um, big, dis big, uh, big connection. They're not allowing change of any form, and their government imposing its restrictions and its law on you is holding them back. And has held them back for a thousand years. Will they ever change? If you look at what I say about comparative religions, one of the differences between Christianity and Islam, Christianity had a period of time called a reformation. It can change. You, know, you can reform. Islam, they got it right the first time, so they're not going to change because they were right the first time. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, you know, why, why can't they not make any scientific progress? Well, without them realizing it, they don't allow it. All right. Um, Something else. Now, when they started conquering the region around North Africa and the region of Syria and the region of um, Persia, a lot of people welcomed them at first. They welcomed them because the Byzantine Empire had imposed really heavy taxes. And of course, you know, the Roman Empire was taxing heavy. And they felt like that under um, Islam, they would be more free. And also, a lot of people thought, hey, you know, under Christianity, there's a lot of drinking going on, a lot of carousing, which we don't agree with, uh, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of sexual immorality that goes on. Let's embrace Islam, or that they don't allow that. So they thought they might have been getting a better deal. But they didn't realize that once they had embraced Islam. Oh, yeah, Islam promised, if you're Christian, we'll let you stay Christian. If you're Jew, we'll let you stay Jew. What they didn't tell them was, but once you convert, if any of your children ever convert to Islam, once you convert, you can never convert back. And folks, this is still part of Sharia law, and I think all of you heard this. Anybody who's Islamic who leaves Islam and converts to another religion is subject to the death penalty. And I have heard, even though I've tried to research and can't prove it, that they have actually killed people in the United States found a way to kill people United States who have converted from Islam to other religions. Um, anyway, now your book starts talking about two groups of people, the Umayyads and the Abbasids, and I want to tell you right now, don't worry about them. They are important perhaps, but I, number one, I never did learn them myself, and uh, I did read them read about them, but uh, I don't know much about them. Um, essentially what happened was the Umayyads took over for a while and uh, they, uh, they replaced the family of Mohammed as being the rulers. But after a while, like all dynasties, they declined and died out. Um, and then the Abbasids took over and uh, the Umayyads lost their religious fervor, but the Abbasids took over and revived a lot of that fervor. Um, but again, don't worry about those names right now. The Abbasids built a city of Baghdad, and Baghdad's very important because it's located on the route from the Mediterranean to Central Asia, and also it's located along the Tigris River, so it could it had access to the Persian Gulf. Baghdad's grown up and become one of the world's larger cities. Now, as is the case of a lot of religious people, Wealth corrupted them. Uh, 
know, I grew up in poverty, and I grew up where my parents were very strong religious, and uh, the people around me had a lot of religious fervor, a lot of poor people do. But here's what happened to them. They went to the workplaces like the rest of us do, and some of them, because they did not use tobacco or didn't drink, and they were pretty good at showing up on time, they got promotions in the workplace. So that'd be great. Except when they got promotions, they got to wearing nicer clothes, driving better cars. They moved out of their old slum neighborhoods into better neighborhoods. And the religious fervor died with it. Maybe the most of you are too young know what I'm talking about. In American history, there's a group of people called the Quakers. The Quakers were very industrious. They started out poor, but because of their hard work and industry and cooperation with each other, some of them became quite wealthy. And with their wealth, I mean, it's Quaker Oats, made by the Quakers. Quaker State motor oil, high quality motor oil, supposedly, you might not think so, made by Quakers. Made some of them very wealthy, and when he got wealthy, they lost their religious zeal, they lost their religious order. This happened to a lot of Islamic people, became wealthy. I mean, hey, they're human like the rest of us. Lost a lot of the religious fervor. Um, they're kings, I mean, they're caliphs. They didn't call them kings, they're caliphs began to uh, marry more, far more than four wives. They began to commit adultery. They began to drink alcohol, at first secretly, then in public. And um, this made a lot of the lower class of the people very, very angry. All right. Um, now, yeah, let's see. This all went on for several hundred years. Now I'm going to skip a little bit and jump into the Crusades. Crusades. Essentially. Now, you'll hear the Crusades from time to time, particularly when uh, the Arabs accused the United States of being crusaders. The crusades were where Europeans, instead of waiting for the enemy to come to them, they decided to take up the offensive and go fight the war on Arab territory. The crusades were to last for a period of 200 years, beginning in 1095 and ending in 1290. That's 195 years. There were some 200 movements that can be called crusades but of those, there are nine that are more important than the others. Of all the 200 or so crusades, the only one that was really a military success was the first crusade. Uh, why were the crusades? Well, the stories got around, and your book tries to say that these stories were chattered. The stories got around that Arabs were robbing persons who wanted to visit the Holy Land. They were called pilgrims. The Europeans would go to the place where Square Christ had lived in the Holy Land, and supposedly these people Pilgrims were being robbed by Arabs. We don't know how true that actually was. But nevertheless, in those days, rumors could get around. And also, the Pope decided it was time to deal with the Arabs. So the Pope, and also the Emperor, the Byzantine Emperor, was very much troubled by the presence of the Arabs in his territory. So uh, he asked for the, the West to help him. He said, you, Can you people come here and help me fight the Arabs? Uh, these Arabs. So between the emperor of the Byzantine Empire, the Pope, and some uh, Europeans who went to, including Peter the Hermit, Peter the Hermit and Walter the Pendulous made a trip to Holy Land and supposedly they were robbed and beat up by Arabs. And they came home to Europe telling about how, the, how badly the Arabs had treated them. So they, um, they got together an army. The first crusade caught the Arab world completely unprepared. And the first crusade actually conquered Jerusalem, set up a couple of kingdoms in the Holy Land region, and went home. The kingdom of Jerusalem was to last 100 years. It was the only military success. The other crusades after that, the crusaders would fight among themselves and quarrel among themselves. And uh, eventually uh, the crusading, now what really killed the crusading spirit though, was in the year 1290, not 12, not 1290 was the last one. In the year 1307, the Black Death hit Europe, and it stopped all such movements dead in the tracks. The Black Death was destined to carry away a third of Europe's population. 
but famine hit Europe. Famine also hit the Muslim world. But um, anyway, they fight between Christian and Muslim was to continue. But then after the Crusades were over with, again, Europeans got the better technology and better weapons, and the rest, they say, is history. The Muslim world fell behind and was to remain behind until to, to this day. Um, Now, um, I'm going to talk more about the Crusades when we come to the second chapters 12 and 13, but just suffice to say the first Crusade was the only one that was a success. Eventually, a Muslim leader named Saladin. Now, in the Muslim world, they don't have a constitution like we have. And a leader, just like in olden times, gets his to be a leader if he can pull himself up by his own bootstraps. And he gets a following if he can if he can command respect. No, he has to command the respect. It's not that people give it to him. I mean, like I've told you, when I was in the army, they taught us you salute that officer because of the office he holds. You're not saluting the man. You're saluting, you're saluting the office. But in those days, I mean, they were honoring the man. Saladin was a highly capable leader. He did something that uh, had not been done. He united a whole lot of the Muslims and convinced them that, hey, we can take on these Europeans. And he drove the Europeans out of Israel and out of the Middle East. Drove the Crusaders out. And the Crusaders never recovered the territory that they lost. Um, now, Saladin made news in my own lifetime. Saddam Hussein claimed that he was descended from both Nebuchadnezzar and Saladin. He liked both men, particularly because Nebuchadnezzar defeated the Jews and carried them captive to, his, to, to Babylon. And Saladin had driven the Christians out of the Holy Land also. So Saddam Hussein dreamed that one of these days he was going to uh, drive the Jews out of Israel. He didn't live long enough to see it. Um, I've got to digress a little bit. And I know that pop says it's later in the end. We got rid of Saddam Hussein. What do we get in its place? ISIS. It reminds me of something I was learning when I was a kid. The Cubans got rid of Batista. They got Castro. The Chinese got rid of Chiang Kai-shek. They got Mao. Do you see what I'm saying? Get rid of a bad guy and replace him with the worst guy. Now I can name you two men who decided I'm tired of my father telling me what to do, my mother telling me to clean up my sink and clean my clothes. I'm going to get away from, I'm going to go someplace where there's no rules. I know what I'll do. I'm going to go join the Marines. The Marines corporals made their father seem like a quiet, mild man. The Marines told them to clean up their boots, and the Marines told them to clean up their sink, and the Marines told them to dress nicely. Much more so than father of the And in both cases, they regretted it. All right. With that